Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Ted Gardner, and I'm an interviewer with the Library of Congress uh, Oral History Project here at our wonderful public library of Cincinnati in the History Department, and Dennis Daly, our great historian here in charge of uh, this project for the Library of Congress. And uh, we're going to be talking this morning to an old friend, Tom Linneman. And uh, Tom, where were you born? Born in Cincinnati here on June 6, 1922. What part of town? Uh, Hyde Park. Hyde Park, and you went to school where? I went to St. Mary's grade school, Purcell High School. Wow. Graduated in 1941 on June 6th, my birthday. How about that? And you, so you are a, you're a, an East Sider by origin. And, um, uh, you know, there are points in, in a person's life that are outstanding dates and so forth. Um, but uh, we'll get to that in a minute. But first, tell, tell us about your family. Uh, my, 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 my mother's family, uh, we had the, she had four children, uh -huh. uh, three boys and a girl. All okay. three of us ended up in the military, which is another story. My own family, I have four children. Okay, uh, well, that's uh, wonderful. And uh, uh, was your father a businessman or what? Yeah, he was in the printing business right down, down the street no down here. No kidding, how about that, yeah. Uh, did you get into that yourself? No, no, I ended up after the war in the rubber business, oh, the yes. industrial rubber business. Very good, very good. Well, um, so after St. Mary's School, then you say Purcell, and that was before it was Purcell Marion, right? Right. <laughs> and a very wonderful, a wonderful private school of the Archdiocese, and I, uh, um, you know, as I mentioned before, uh, there are times in a person's life that uh, really stand out. Uh, after your graduation from high school, uh, what did you look forward to? Okay, I didn't go to college at that time. Uh, my dad's business had gone belly up. My two brothers had graduated from, from college before that. There wasn't any money, and I wasn't particularly a college student at that time anyway, so I went to work up until October when I was drafted. I see, I see. So you were in the class of 1940? 41. 41, 41, okay. And uh, where were you on uh, Pearl Harbor Day, 7th of December, 1941? <laughs> I was in a, a little saloon down in <laughs> Dutchtown, O'Brienville, uh -huh. drinking beer. How about that? At the, uh, I can't remember the name of the place. But anyway, about <laughs> 4 o'clock, somebody came in and said, Pearl Harbor's been bombed. And everybody, first question is, where is Pearl where Harbor? Is Pearl? Well, we found out in short order. That was very, very common, yeah. of course, yeah. yes. Well, uh, as you look forward to the military, uh, did you enlist or? No, I was drafted and I ended up taking my basic training up at Fort Hancock, New Jersey. Fort Hancock? Uh, in the middle of winter, which was a nice place to do it in spring, summer, and fall. But winter was kind of cold. Fort Hancock is a little peninsula that juts out into the New York Harbor. It's a coast artillery place. Oh, yeah. And uh, it was interesting because on the weekend, you'd get a weekend pass and a little old boy from Cincinnati could get the ferry and go across and land at the Battery or Lower Manhattan, then try to figure out for the first time how to ride a subway and to get up to 42nd and Broadway where the action was. So it's sure. a great soldier's town. Sure. But, uh, well, that was, a, that was a great experience for a youngster, wasn't oh, it? Oh, yeah, a lot of fun. New York was a great soldier's town. Oh, my gosh, yeah. After that, uh, I ended up being a replacement in the 113th Infantry, and that's an interesting story because during World War I, the 113th was part of the 29th Division, which I later became a replacement in. But in uh, World War I, they had the Square Division, four regiments, but somewhere along the line between W1 and W2, uh, they changed the divisions to a triangular division. They only had three regiments, and the 113th was orphaned. Uh, but they were National Guard, New Jersey National Guard. Uh, the Guard had been called up before the war, and they were on maneuvers down in Carolina. It's kind of an interesting story because Pearl Harbor, the 7th, the day of the living infantry, they were immediately sent back to New Jersey. And the story was they had a political hack from mayor of New Jersey, Mayor Hague, the one to be sure he took care of his troops. He brought them back to 
<coughs> harboring to New Jersey to guard New Jersey. <laughs> and what the 113th was doing was walking beach patrol. Actually, they were responsible for three streets, uh, Long Island, New York, New Jersey, and, and Delaware. And boy, that was, uh, we didn't realize at the time, but if you wanted to fight a war, that was a place to be. <laughs> what you do in the daytime, you didn't have anything to do at nighttime or early in the evening. They'd put us in trucks and take us up and down the coast. When it got dark, uh, there was 12 of us in each detail. Four, two guys would work, walk north and two south, and they walked for an hour till they ran to the guys coming down from the other thing. <laughs> then you go back into the hut and go to sleep. If you know the third kit, you walked only two hours. And we're walking the beaches, like, you know, people spend great money to go down to Florida to walk the beach of New Jersey, <laughs> and I'm getting paid for this thing. Sure. Uh, it was uh, war in wintertime, it could be a little gamey if you had a nor'western, but in the springtime and summer, it was great. Oh, yeah. But some way, somebody down in Washington figured out that if Adolf Hitler couldn't get across from the Pas de Calais 15 miles and land in England, how in the heck was he going to get over to New Jersey and what are we doing with all those red-redded guys walking the beaches? Because the guys on uh, uh, in Guadalcanal were getting their licks in the first division in, in Africa, Cage Kaiser and Faster, and they needed replacements. They said, sure. boy, let's get those guys. <laughs> they took us off of there, sent us overseas. We went overseas, the trip over was uneventful. We got to England about a month before D-Day in a replacement depot. And we were just waiting no, we're for the big June, day. June, June, June of 44. I can remember on D-Day, my 22nd birthday, I was still in England. We were on a forced train march. And early in the afternoon, the news came down the line of March that the invasion had started. Which they knew that was going to be problems. Within a week, we were sent down to southern England in a, one of the uh, replacement death places where the get you ready to go overseas. Mm -hmm. I remember the night before we were over, they served us a great big meal, steak, potatoes, the whole nine yards. And I'm thinking, it's, boy, is this like the, the last supper yeah, right. before you guys go into the chair, you know. <laughs> Got over to England about, I th uh, to France, uh, uneventfully uh, landed about, I guess about 10 days after D-Day and landed at Omaha Beach. And at that time, they, uh, they had cleaned up the mess. There weren't bodies floating around as they were on D-Day. And within, I guess, uh, the second week, I ended up as a replacement in the 29th Division, which is the second time I was a replacement in a yeah. regiment of the 29th Division. <laughs> and, uh, what was, was the nickname of the 29th? Did that have a nickname? Uh, the, like blue and, the Blue and Gray. The Blue and Gray. Blue and Gray, yeah. 29, famous, let's go. Famous and uh, they were supposed to have taken St. Lo the first week of the war. Uh, when I got there, it was two weeks later, and we were still on the high ground around St. Lowe. And it was a very lonely experience because <clears throat> when you're in the service, you get some buddies, and you have good friends, and you look out for each other. But when you're in a replacement, you keep moving up, and your buddy goes here, and your other buddy goes there. By the time I got in the front line, I knew nobody. And we were in Hedgerow country. They took me, and Did I thought Did you lose some friends? No, they were just moving to different places, okay? I, uh, I thought it was very nice. They already had a foxhole dug for me. <laughs> well, it wasn't too nice because the guy I'm over here, that was his best buddy's foxhole, and he had been uh, wounded or killed, I don't know what. So it was very, very lonely. So we were up there for, oh, up till about July the 13th. It's now five weeks later, we still hadn't taken St. Louis. St. Louis was very important. Yeah town to take. There was eight roads leading out of it. They needed that town to move out into the rest of Normandy. That was a desperate So city. one of the stories I remember vividly that day, they pulled us off the line, moved us behind our lines. We were moving behind our lines from the right to left, and we came over an intense artillery barrage. Now, we weren't near our foxhole. When the artillery comes in, the safest place to be in a foxhole, you're safe with everything but a, a direct hit. When you're walking across the field, the only thing you do is the fastest you can, get as down as fast. And uh, you had just a second, because you could hear the shells coming in, hmm. so you tried to get down, and you started praying. And I had a quick prayer with Jesus, mercy, Jesus help me, and get flat. <laughs> and we took a tremendous barrage, and guys were getting hit all over the place. It's most humiliating, because it was our own artillery. It was the whole fire order firing oh. short, friendly, Friendly fire wasn't very friendly. 
two, uh, two or three guys I know were hurt, and I don't know if they killed anybody, with panic when the artillery finally stopped, everybody got up and started running to the rear. It was a hero of the day, a second lieutenant, I'll never forget, it, stood in the hedgerow opening with a 45, threatened to shoot anybody that ran to the rear. Mm -hmm. uh, let's talk about a little about hedgerows, incidentally. Yeah. Of all the planning they did for D-Day, they had many practices landing, but they had no planning for it once they got in. And they were amazed at the, the terrain they found. There was a uh, hedgerow country, and what's a hedge? It's an earthen fence. And these things go back to the 10th century. Hmm. And uh, the Normans built these around their fields. It's an earthen mound, maybe five, six feet thick, three, four, five feet high, and down through the centuries, trees and vegetation had grown out of them. Thick. And uh, take a football field, a little bigger, and build these things around. And then when you're attacking, you had to go from field to field. You had to climb over the hedgerow. The Germans are on the other side, and you're running across the field, and they were firing at you. Well, anyway, when we got into a uh, sunken road as we were moving, getting ready to go into the attack, and I ran into a guy that I knew from basic training. He had come over as a replacement. I didn't realize he was in the 29th Division. Interesting uh, Cincinnati story on it because uh, he uh, was from St. Bernard, and he went to Roger Bacon High School, and I went to Purcell. And I said, oh, Tom, geez, we knew it all acquaintance. How are you doing? We're talking about the impending attack, which we're supposed to talk about. And uh, we heard a uh, artillery shell. We had nothing to worry about it because you can always hear your own artillery. You can hear it fire and then you can hear it whistling over your head, hopefully. Well, this one didn't whistle overhead. It was another short round. It landed directly behind me. And I didn't have time to get down. It knocked me down. And Tom was standing right in front of me. And Concussion? I, no, I, I took shrapnel. I had about oh. three pieces of shrapnel on my back, one on my elbow and one on my hip. The one on my hip still there. Wow. Scared the heck out of me, and I finally got up and took inventory. I still had all my body parts and asked Tom if he was hurt. No, he wasn't hurt, and I kidded him years later. We <laughs> used to work with the post office down here. That, that thing landed behind me. Here's the Fursell guy, and here's the Roger Bacon guy. I took all the shrapnel head towards the Roger Bacon guy and saved him from getting <laughs> Anyway, it wasn't a, what we call a million-dollar wound. Million dollar wounds where you still got all your body parts, but they send you back home, no more combat. Mm -hmm. I turned around and looked where that shell had hit, and boy, it's something I'll never forget because there were three guys from my platoon committed the cardinal sin of combat. You don't bunch up. Three guys are talking to each other. And the best I can figure, that shell was detonated by a direct hit on one of the guys from my platoon. Mm -hmm. And there wasn't anything left but a pair of legs and they were grotesquely laying on top of the other two guys who were killed instantly. Oh my God. And I look back on that and say, boy, mm -hmm. there for the grace of God go yeah, I. I know that one guy is buried over in Normandy on their cross that says known only to God. Well, I got back to England, they passed me up. Little interesting story there because when I had left the uh, States, uh, we're in Camp Shanks, New York, and I got a, and the next day we're supposed to get on the uh, the boat, and I got a wire from my mother, and she had just got a wire, and here it is, and she says, mm -hmm. the wire was reporting that my older brother, Jack, had been reported missing in action. Well, I wanted to go home to mother, and I went to my commanding officer, and it says, sorry, you're on the boat next day, and I was, so I didn't know what happened to him. Went overseas, and uh, never got any mail over there, so I never knew what happened. Well, I'm in England at this stage, and I told you I had three brothers. My other brother, Bob, was in the Air Force, and he was back in the States, radio operator training for V-17s. Well, I'm laying in this tent hospital in southern England, recuperating, this is about in August, and a staff sergeant from the 8th Air Force comes by. I can see the stripes, and they look, and as I look, oh my God, he kept walking, and he turned around, it was my brother, Bob. <gasps> God, a great family reunion. Oh, didn't know he was God. over there. My God. So we talked, and of course, then I asked him about Brother Jack, and Mother had got the second telegram that he was killed in action. They found him. And by this found time, my, my brother Bob knew all about that. He knew that my mother had got the third one, that I was seriously wounded. Uh -huh. So a kind of sideline story to this. He was over there flying combat missions. He didn't want to worry mother because mom had, had enough problems. He told yeah. her he had a desk job, which made a good story up until the front page of the Enquirer was a picture of a V-17 crew coming back from a successful raid over Berlin. They had the 
crew pictured in front of it, and underneath it, the names, and there was Staff Sergeant Radar Officer Robert Linneman. <laughs> so that blew his story. So <laughs> blew my mother knew really had big problems. Oh. Okay, man. so uh, uh, they patched me up, and I went back and joined the 29th Division just at the end of the breast campaign. I missed that, fortunately, because oh, it was a brutal battle. The breast was terrible. And yeah. uh, <clears throat> boy, there was a great rumor immediately after that because the 29th Division had landed at Omaha Beach and St. Lo, Vere, and Brest, that they were now going to be occupational troops in the Fort of Brest. And I said, boy, that's a winner. That rumor lasted about two days. And the next thing you know, we're in boxcars going over to catch up with the rest of the war, which Moving is on, now on, yeah. on the German border. It took wow. a couple of days. Remember the last day we, we rode out of France into Belgium, detrained in Belgium, and walked into Holland. And one day I went through three European <laughs> countries. And we were on the line at uh, <clears throat> uh, in Holland, in October the uh, 3rd, the 29th went into the attack, crossed the German border, and we captured a, <clears throat> pardon me, a small town called Brevaren. And my uh, uh, company was not in the attack. We came in later in the day to take up defensive positions. Just a small community, a farm community, one long road. And as we're walking up the road, my sergeant, who I had just met recently, it's putting two guys in each house, and you two guys go in here, and they go to the next house, go in here, take off a defensive position. We're now walking by a church, and he says, Soldier, you go in here, he don't know my name. Take this VIR man with a rounding automatic and go in the church and take off a defensive position. Well, I'm trying to think, how can we take a defensive? You no know, place to dig in. And furthermore, it troubled me because churches are God's house. You don't fight a war in a church. It's a place of prayer and understanding and peace. What troubled me particularly is not only a church, but it's a Catholic church, and I'm Catholic, and here I am fighting a war in a Catholic church. It shouldn't be. <laughs> <coughs> anyway, we, it was getting later in the afternoon. We were trying to figure out what we were going to do there. We went up onto the front, went over in the sacristy, and I can remember I could stand on a bench, look out the back window, and about, oh, a couple hundred yards, two, three, four hundred yards behind it was a wooded area, and you could see movement. That's where the Germans had uh, uh, moved back to. In the meantime, my VAR man, who wasn't a particularly religious man, was trying to figure out how he was going to sleep that night. He approached to take all the free vestments out of the locker and put it on a bench so he'd have something soft to sleep on. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking, boy, desecrating sacred vestments in this stage is not in my best interest. But in the meantime, I'm back in the main body of the church and there's an altar railing around him. And old Tom is on his knees praying because I knew from the first time what, what could happen when I go into combat. And uh, you heard that old chestnut, your prayers are always answered. When I get to heaven, the good Lord will in. I don't want to talk one on one, find out what the good Lord had in answering, answering my prayer. Because as I'm praying there, truthfully, the artillery, the Germans started shelling the town that they'd just been kicked out of earlier in the day. One of the shells hit the top of their church and knocked a lot of the clay tiles off. You hear them sliding down and crashing on the side. Well, the VIR man at that stage beat it up to the front door because the artillery was coming from the rear, no place to dig in. We figured anything coming in would have to hit in the rear of the church. We were safe there, which we were, and we watched that whole town being partially burned, blew apart. Suddenly the artillery stopped. Good news, bad news. The VIR man knew what the bad news was because he had been up fighting longer than I had. That stage, he says to me, hey, I'm getting the hell out of here. And that clown takes off running off with his VAR man to the rear. Leaves me standing in the uh, door. I've got a fixture over there. Where do I bring that over there? It's a fixture of the church. Anyway, uh, I'm standing in this front door of the church. And the way you attacked and when you're fighting, first thing you do if you can attack, you send in artillery. Mm -hmm. And then after the artillery, the, the uh, infantry moves. And the Germans were good. They would come up under the protective cover of their own artillery, staying safely back. When it stopped, Three or eight times, they'd move up the rest of the way. And it wasn't 10 minutes after that artillery stopped. I'm standing in the front door of this church, and I could hear movement coming along the side. They were, kept stepping on these tiles. I could hear every step. Sure. And they eventually come around the front. They're about, oh, over there where your cameraman is. But they're back to me. They turn around. I'm dead. And I'm figuring, well, somebody's dead better them than I am. This is supposed to be I'd trade for, and I had to do something. I'd take me trusty M1 rifle. Sight down the barrel. I wasn't worried about shooting in the back. This is in the John Wayne movie. 
squeeze off a shot. Horror of horrors, my gun doesn't fire, all I get is a big click. Well, those guys heard that. They turned around and saw me with a rifle point out. They started running around the corner. <coughs> and in the meantime, I pulled the Volfac, put another shot in as they're running, and I squeezed off a shot that didn't work. I know it, uh, the gun fired. I know it didn't hit them. You hit somebody that close with a M1 rifle, you turn them everywhere you but loose. Now I'm scared big time. And I want to go over and find my sergeant who was next door in the rectory. <laughs> I didn't know if these clowns were still standing around the corner, so I took a grenade, pulled the pin out, stepped out of the door, threw a sword to uh, detonate over the side of the church where they may have been standing. Immediately after that, I take off running. Well, Ted, if I can stop this great actually, I will share with you. You have just listened to the complete sum total of my contribution to World War II. I fired one M1 rifle shot, which didn't hit anybody. I threw a grenade, and I don't think it hurt anybody. But anyway, I take off running off. Now, to get from the church to the rectory where the sergeant had set up his command post, I had to run through a graveyard. Boy, I remember running through there, dodging through the tombstones, and I successfully got over to the rectory. You know, I thought years later if they'd shot me there, wouldn't that be inconvenient, getting killed in a graveyard? They could have dug a hole, Take dug me hole up. My, my mother would have known what happened to her baby. Anyway, I get into the uh, rector and ask, Sergeant, where are you? Sergeant, I go in the kitchen. He's not, that's where he was early in the evening. Where are you, Sergeant? And I looked at the living room, dining room on the floor. Where is everybody? And somebody said, for God's sake, shut up. I'm down in the basement. Oh, so down in the basement, there's my sergeant. He's got about five or six guys from the squad or from the platoon with him. Uh, he shouldn't have had those guys down there. They should have been dug out somewhere firing at these incoming Germans. I said, what are we going to do? And, well, the sergeant knew what he was going to do. He figured, well, the best thing he could do is let the f rest of the platoon fight off the attack. <laughs> well, we didn't fight it off very well. The Germans took that town back. Uh, we did a lousy job of defending it. About two hours they took the town back. At one wow. stage there was a German tank running up and down the street firing. And uh, uh, we were down there all night. We were down there uh, all through the night. Sergeant, what are we going to do? Well, Sergeant figured the best thing to do is wait till morning at this stage when our guys come <laughs> back up. We can come out of the base with a real fighting machine happening. That was very good planning on his part, except he failed to tell the 29th to come back in and save us. <clears throat> it's now about 10 o'clock in the morning. We've done that basement about 12 hours. In the meantime, the Germans had taken over the rectory as their command post. <laughs> and they're upstairs. You can hear them eating breakfast up there and yakking. I think about 10 o'clock, one German soldier came down. And he wasn't looking for us. He was looking for something he could steal or something he could find to eat. Gets down there, it's pitch black in the basement. He lights a match. The boy, and he sees about five guys, six guys pointing rifles out. He dropped the match and runs upstairs screaming. And uh, I, I thought later on, you know, we, we could have shot that guy. And if we did, it would have been the end of the story. Cut. Because all they had to do was throw a grenade down. And there would have been one dead German of five or six uh, dead Americans. And you don't win a war with those ratios. Mm -hmm. Well, at this stage, the Germans knew we were down there. And now they started shouting down at us, and he continued to shout down at us. And I had a true story, I had a flashback. <clears throat> when I went to a cell, it took two years to German. I, had, I got a C, and I don't think I deserved it, but I remember the professor <laughs> telling the class, pay attention, learn a second language, you might help you someday. I had a flashback. God, I wish I'd stayed awake in that class. But what they were shouting, we figured out, was, Kohn C. Rouse, mit Hundi Ho, come on out with your hands up. So the sergeant says, well, you better go up. So we walked up the steps, and the gentleman, I thought this was my last day on the earth. Obviously, it didn't happen. We were taken prisoners of war. Uh, where do we go from there? The interesting story of prisoners of life, I'll try to run through as quickly as I can. Uh, that day, they marched us back to the rear of Germany, and they walked, we walked all day. We got to our town, I believe it was Aachen. It had a small compound there. Mm. Well, they had about 20-plus oh, prisoners there. It was a P-51 <coughs> violet, most of the guys from the from the 29th Division. And we went in for the interrogation, which is kind of interesting. I was one of the last guys interrogated. We went in and the uh, interrogator was a Luf German Luftwaffe officer. And uh, he opened up the conversation saying he lived at one time in, in the United States, lived in Miami Beach and tell him about Miami Beach. Then he got down to business and he wanted to know all the facts. We're supposed to give him name, rank, and serial number. 
So we gave him the name and we gave him the rank and the serial number. Then he wanted some more information. He says, what was your division? And I'm saying, sir, I can't tell you. Name, rank, and serial number. And he, he says, I got a 29th patch on. He says, well, I see you're on the 29th division. Oh, okay. Then he wanted to know what uh, division and regiment. I said, sir, I was in the 29th division. That's all I can tell you. He says, well, you were L Company, 175th. Hmm. Uh, I said, well, Okay, so he writes that down. Then he wanted to know some of the name of the officers, and I didn't even know the name of the officers. He says, well, we got Lieutenant so forth, and Lieutenant so forth are prisoners. That guy knew more about my company than I did. The last thing uh, uh, I figured, geez, he kept asking questions. He got down to one of some nitty-gritty, what boat did you come on? Well, and everybody came over to Queen Mary. I didn't come over to Queen Mary. I came over on another ship. I told him Queen Mary. He writes that down. That's one for me. But the last one, he says, well, where'd you take your basic training? <clears throat> I told him, Camp Webb. Well, any old army boy will know Camp Webb. There is no Camp Webb. It's a fictitious flight. Where is Camp Webb? Located about that far up the spider's ass. <laughs> so he writes that down, Camp Webb. <laughs> okay, we were there for a couple of days. They put us in boxcars for two days. We rode up to 12A Limburg, which is a hellhole. They told us to a temporary camp, fortunately. Uh, while there, uh, boy, I had a tough time. Uh, now, what, uh, what time of year was this? This now? is October. So it's getting cold. It's starting to get cold. Yeah. And we were in a barracks at, uh, t at 12A. Speaking of cold, uh, we slept in these barracks and they had slots that went across it. Yeah. To make the, and some of the clouds, in order to get some heat, and had a furnace and they would start burning the slots, you know, <laughs> these, the red slots. So there wasn't that many. The Germans kept loading prisoners into there, and guys ended up sleeping on the floor. And some of the cops, there, they couldn't get there because there wasn't anybody. Anyway, about the middle of the night, about the third night I was there, I became deathly ill. Hmm. Uh, my body was trying to get adjusted to the lousy food they were serving us. And I got up in the middle of the night, I had to go to the John. And to get to the John, you had to walk up to the end of the barracks. They wouldn't let us outside to the lower train. They put a milk can there. And to get up there, I had to step on these guys sleeping in the, in the aisle, and they would come up yelling at me, and, geez, I'm sick as free. I get up there, and I'm sick at both ends. Hmm. And I thought, gee, I'm not sure I was going to live. I managed to get back to my cot with the same problem, stepping on everybody, survive that. That was one of the worst days I had as a PW. Well, as I say, I wasn't sure. I was praying that But night. you were wounded, too. You were carrying the shrapnel. Yeah, but I was, <clears throat> I was all right. That shrapnel still in here, incidentally. It didn't bother you that but anyway, uh, we finally got out of there, and I knew the, uh, they were going to send us to another camp, and I knew that was going to be rough on that train ride, so I tried to save a little extra ration, part of my bread ration I had up in the pocket. They took us down, put us on the 40 and 8s. That's 40 and 8s. Well, it should be 40 or 8s. 40 men or 8 horses. Only in this case, it was 50, 55 men. And we took off, and we were on there for three days, and it was the worst experience I had. Uh, we started out, there wasn't enough room to lay down, but that was about all. Uh, the guys were getting feisty, and everybody was arguing. About the second day out, one of the cars in the back went bad, so they took it off, and they put the prisoners, and started loading them into other cars, and they put 10 or 15 more. We must have had 60 plus in this 40 and 8. Wow. Now, it's just enough room to stand up. And to sleep, what you do, you get a buddy and you'd squat down and he'd stand over the top of you and then you'd try to sleep for a half an hour and then you'd take turns. And when the train stopped, the air was very foul. We had a uh, guy named Davis, a Jewish guy, who could speak uh, German. And the, uh, when the train stopped, the guards would be outside and he'd keep calling out to them, uh, Posten, guard, loof, loof, air. Uh, the air was very foul. Mm. And eventually, a guy started, one guy passed out from not enough room. He's laying on the ground. We tried to make enough room for him. And boy, what a horrible experience. Other guys saw that. Well, you know, you could get down with fake passing out. Mm. In the meantime, other guys are swinging. It was a horrible, horrible experience. After three days, we finally got to 7A, which is down in Bavaria, Mooseburg. It's about 35 kilometers from Munich. And as I look back on it, if I had a day in some place, that was about as good as you can get. It was away from most of the fighting. It was in southern Germany. And the good part about it was about 100 miles from Switzerland. As a POW, according to the Geneva Convention, you were entitled to and supposed to get a Red Cross parcel, one box per man per week. 
box was 12 by 12 by 4, and in there was some great stuff. Spam, which tasted like filet mignon, they had crees and crackers, they had a little can of powdered coffee, mm. <coughs> had a bigger can of Klim, Fair Stay Klim, Kel L-A-M, spell it backwards, M-I-L-K, powdered milk. You put some water and you had milk. Uh, and the other thing you had in there was a bar of so very value, but they also had a form of currency. Well, currency, define your terms. Actually, they were American cigarettes. Mm -hmm. And everything was valued on the American cigarette. The pound, the mark, the lira, the dollar had no value. And we never got a steady supply of the boxes. When you got them, it was two men on a box. You had to split it. And a half a box was a, still a pretty good deal. You could survive. Mm. Then there were days when you didn't get the Red Cross parcel, maybe a week or two. And that was interesting because then you're living on German uh, ration, which is lousy at best. The morning was a cup of hot uh, Esats, they called the coffee. Uh, when we got our Red Cross cross, we had our own ground coffee. We didn't, use, we didn't use their coffee. We could use their coffee for hot water to, to shave with. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, we had, uh, okay, then the, the cigarettes, when the boxes weren't coming in, and you're living on German rations, and some guys, you know, had, had to have a smoke. Sure. Well, Change we'd get smoker. for lunch, for breakfast, we'd get this coffee for lunch, a bowl <clears throat> of slop or soup made from sugar beets. Everyone saw you might kind of a tate in it. And dinner time, you'd get a loaf of bread for six men or five men. And the problem was you had to cut it up. So we had a, an equal part. So we'd cut, cut the uh, cards. We had a deck of cards who had the honor of cutting it up. And the guy who got the honor also had the honor of taking the last piece. So you've got to believe he did his best in cutting up five, uh, six equal pieces. And that's the time in my life when I decided, uh, and I was smoking, and I said, hey, would you rather eat or smoke? And that was the easy decision. If I smoked, I did it very sparingly. Like I'd smoke it halfway down, pinch it. Smoke it the rest of the way down, pinch it. Never threw a butt away, because on the way down, somebody would grab you. Save the butts, <laughs> get five or six bucks, and you could roll them. And at that stage, I said, would you rather eat or smoke? And I said, I can go away with the smoking. So things went on. As a POW, uh, we were forced to work. And this is according to the Geneva Convention. Uh, privates and not first class privates had non-coms and officers did not have to work. Mm -hmm. And working could be a blessing in some way, depending on how and when. You didn't work all the days and every day, but when you got caught on the work detail, they would take hundreds out of the camp, up to the local railroad station, <coughs> put them on a railroad train and ride us into Munich, 25 miles away. We'd get into Munich and work on whatever they wanted. There'd be one guard and 10 prisoners. I'd post and Was Saint Munich Gavone. damaged by Please? that? Was Munich damaged by that time? Was the what? Was Munich uh, damaged? Munich was severely damaged. And what we were doing is repairing the, uh, the damage. Most of the time, repairing the railroads. <clears throat> the 8th and the 15th did a good job of screwing up the German railroads, and we prisoners did a pretty good job of putting them back together. As soon as we put them back together, guess what? There'd be another raid, sure. and they'd blow up what we have to do it over. There was one, I'll tell you one quick story. There was a detail that guys would fight to get on. There was a detail went to a restaurant. One guard, 10 prisoners, the Cafe Leopold in Munich. It was one of the top restaurants in Munich, something like the Masonette used to be down. And whoever you work for had to feed you, feed you lunch. And you work for the railroad, they fed you at lousy soup. But you were in the restaurant, he has in the restaurant, he takes us in and feeds us in the restaurant. We're sitting at a table with a tablecloth on. Wow. The other tables over there, the German civilians, and they're eating, and we're eating the same food. Good bowl of German soup, a piece of German bread and some food. But that was <coughs> incidental because what this guy was running was a great black market. He'd take us down after lunch into the basement, and he had a lot of bread. He would sell the guys. And you could buy the bread with American cigarettes, and that was he was after, American cigarettes, and the bar of soap had value. Sure. And we'd start out, he wanted uh, same, uh, uh, same cigarette, nine kilo bread, 10 cigarettes for a loaf of bread. And we'd say, Nick, see what see what we negotiate. We'd get a loaf of bread for eight or nine cigarettes. Mm -hmm. and if you got that loaf, you're in pretty good shape for a couple of weeks. Problem was getting it back to camp that night. They'd have it search you when you come back in. But I figured out I had a GI overcoat on and I sewed a pocket down to the bottom and I'd insert the bread down in there. I could get it back in. 
Wow. So anyway, life went on, and, and the CW camper was uh, watch and wait. When you were going to win the war, it wasn't a question who was going to win, but how long and what was going to happen when it was over. So uh, 7A was reasonably good up until late February, early March, and by that time, all of a sudden, this camp that came was due. What was transferring is the advancing armies were coming into other camps, and Stalag Luft uh, three, you heard that story. Three, yeah. <clears throat> they took most of those prisoners out of there before the Russians got to them and moved them in, and a lot of them, thousands of them, ended in our camp. And I guess there was twice as many sheep in that camp that the camp could hold. At that stage, it got a little, little gamey. <laughs> I remember, oh, it's in April, and uh, we were on one particular work detail that day. Boy, that was a detail you wanted. Every once you got that. They had latrines, and when the latrines would fill up the honey wagon to come and punk, push the stuff out of there, and they'd take it out into a nearby field, and they had trenches, and they'd put it in there mm -hmm. and let it sit and ripen. And when the uh, liquid would get out of it, uh, they would then ask the details of prisoners to go out and shovel this. And what you were doing is shoveling stools. Or may I say shoveling shit, is that all right? Anyway, that was a detail you didn't want to get on. But we came back that night, and we got back to the camp, and we found that President Roosevelt had died. It's kind of interesting. The next day we had a memorial service for him, and everybody was out of their barracks, standing in formation, a chaplain somewhere along one of the camps was saying the proper words, and Taps was in tone. It was kind of interesting because off in the distance you could hear a flight of V-17s flying somewhere and keeping the war going. Well, the next day we were told we were leaving the camp, our barracks. We had to get out because they're bringing in all these officers from Stalag Luft Three. And they had to get rid of some of the peons, the privates. So they took us out of the camp the next day. We walked up to the local railroad station. There must have been, I don't know, 10, 15, 20 cars, I forget which, and loaded us and took us into Munich. And uh, got into Munich. We'd been there before, and then we'd come back in the daytime. Well, this time they disconnected the engine, parked the damn si uh, cars over in the Marston Yards, then proceeded to tell us that we're going to live in these uh, boxcars for the rest of the war. Oh we complained bitterly you can't do the other Red Cross or our fields were to no avail. Sure. In the morning they'd open up the box cars, you'd just go out in the, in the rails and start putting them back together. There was many air raids, they'd get us an air raid shelter in the daytime. Hmm. Kind of interesting, at night, the British fall night, and Munich was taking a, a, lot of, a lot of flack at that time. Kind of interesting because they, they wouldn't let us in an air raid shelter at night. They'd open the doors, we'd go out in the nearby field and get in a, in a hole from a future fast uh, uh, raid and hope you were safe there and then watch and you could see the bombs coming down there they were incinerary bombs just like in a fourth of july display fortunately none of them were around us for the two weeks and it was on oh, oh the day i forget it was may 7th i think uh, our guards knew what was going on they were getting very friendly at this time instead of when we came back from work instead of putting us in the box cars they took us up to a nearby Luftschutz room, air raid shelter. We went in there, we're standing there, just about enough room to sit back there. By this time, the guards were very friendly. They stacked their arms up against her. We could have taken over any time. As the evening wore on, where were the guards? I don't know, they're gone. They checked the door. Somebody went upstairs. Guards were in a CYA, cover your ass. They took off, left us unguarded. So we're in this air raid shelter, waiting. We posted our own guards all night, the next morning. <laughs> About early afternoon, the guys upstairs shouted down, Here they come! Boy, we all pulled out of the air raid cellar. We're standing on Arnaustrasse, a suburb of Munich, Munich. Down the street comes a jeep, a staff car, a tank, and the 42nd Division. Munich was, for all intents, an open city. There was little or no fighting. The Germans all had white sheets hanging out. Mm -hmm. They came by and we, came, we waved at them and they stopped and they were doing it. He says, well, the uh, reception committee, Chamber of Commerce, welcome to Munich. Take the town, it's yours. God, I remember I went over as a tank and I kissed that first tank. And I said, thank you, God, I'm going to get out of this war alive. Kind of interesting because uh, I read a guy from the 42nd uh, from Lima, Ohio, and he was in a Jeep and they were going on to into the rest of Munich. And I, being a bit of a historian, I thought, boy, this history is happening. Why not I go down there? Because we had worked in Munich quite often. I was familiar with the town. 
we drove down into the main plots or square in Munich where they had that famous Glockenspiel and got the trial with all the DPs, displaced persons and, and uh, uh, prisoners of war and con concentration people are all, all out there raising a cane and somehow they always managed to find something to drink and everybody's drinking. <laughs> And it was just a gale of settlement. The Germans went around, they got there, uh, they knew they were in trouble, and the ones who were around, they were getting handled pretty roughly. I spent the night with the 42nd Division. I remember they had liberated a carton of, of some kind of liquor. It was yellow, like Juliana, I guess, and we were drinking that. Next morning, they had to take off, and uh, they left, and I grabbed three bottles and walked back to where we had the liberators, not far. Mm -hmm. And what had transpired there, that was interesting because the 42nd is now in charge of us, and they got, I don't know, there must have been 500, six, 700 of us there, and they didn't know what to do with us. They weren't gonna put us back in that air raid shelter and going back in the boxcars weren't an option. Right across the street was a huge German apartment complex. Uh, and they said, how would you like to go there? And somebody just said, fine, but there's civilians there. He says, not to fear. We went in and said a detail, knocked on the door and told the German civilians, Rouse, get out. Mm -hmm. We moved in. That sounds a little cruel, but how do you justify it? All fair in love and war to the victor belongs to spoils and we're living in an apartment high in the hog. That night, for the first night, I slept on a bed with a white sheet. I forgot what a sheet was like. Was able to take my uniform, my clothes, my dirty clothes off and sleep out of them for the first time I was a prisoner. Hmm. Very quick story. On the third day, uh, we have been living in this apartment, a chaplain came by and he wanted to have a, ch a church service. He was a Catholic chaplain. And they had a courtyard in this apartment. I said, boy, I'm gonna go to that. Cause I, you remember, I remember in my early days, they told us how to pray. There was four ways to pray. There's petition, contrition, adoration, thanksgiving, petition, please God help me. Adoration, thank you God. Uh, thanksgiving, thank or, uh, adoration. Adoration, thank you, God, we adore you, and thanksgiving. So it was time for me to forget the contrition and start worrying on some thanksgiving. Thanks, God. So I went to the service. Boy, I went to church and got, went communion, got my batteries charged. After the church service, we wanted to talk to the chaplain. He didn't have time. We wanted to know the war wasn't over yet. And what's going on? He didn't have time. He had to go out to a nearby camp. Well, during the three days we were there, we heard about this nearby nearby camp. The 42nd had liberated it the day before they liberated us. Hmm. <clears throat> and I had talked to a lot of the guys and what they were telling me about this place, I found it hard to believe. And to this day, I don't know why I, I asked the chaplain, could I go out there with this camp? Because I didn't, I had Thomas, the doubting one, I had to see it. And we went out there, rode out with the chaplain, the chaplain's driver, there's a job to get in soon, the chaplain's driver. Another PW and I, P.O.W. and I went out, we walked up to that, drove up to that camp. The first thing I remember, there's a little stream running right there. It was a dead German soldier half in this stream. All I remember about it, he was quite dead, but this finger was missing. Somebody had cut off his finger so they could steal his ring. Hmm. From there, things went downhill. We went in the first thing that they sprayed us with a uh, disinfectant. On the uh, front gate, there was a sign that says, Arbeiten macht frech. Work makes you free. The name of this camp was Dachau. Oh Dachau, God. one of the notorious death camps of Hitler. Yeah. And this chaplain was out there for a particular reason because he wanted to go to three particular barracks with that isolated and imprisoned clergyman, mostly Catholic priest. And he took us into this barracks and they lived in barracks similar to the way we did. They had these four, four, and four and we walked in there and the guys who were walking around on these striped uniforms were nothing but skin and bones. And what they were doing in the last part of the war, they stopped feeding the prisoners, or greatly reduced them. They were all slowly starving to death. And they tell the story, <coughs> when we went in there, and I'm looking around, and there's guys still laying in the bed. It's not noontime, and you, they weren't moving. I wasn't sure if they're alive or dead. Well, what would transfer, they would go through early in the morning and take the prisoners that had died the night, the day before, and during the night, take their bodies out, carry them out, put them on the front door, like you take out the garbage, put a pile of bodies there, then a lift a truck would come by, pushed by a, a German, uh, uh, the other prisoner, pick up the bodies and take them away. Goodness and I sense. thought years later, uh, well, remember the early days of Christianity and what the Romans did to the, to the Christians in the Colosseum. They used to feed the, 
The Christians of the lions. Hey, how many Christians can the lions eat? The Germans in the 20th century had to find martyr and down to a fine art. They were killing them by the thousands. Yes, yes. Well, one it of the beautiful been... parts of the story, I went, he took us next door to a barracks and this wasn't one where they lived then, it was one where they ate and they had converted to a temporary chapel. They'd put an altar up at the end, and the table was flowery duck, and these priests were having the opportunity to say their first mass mm -hmm. since they were prisoners. And here was a guy in a striped uniform with a priestly robe on and hold it onto the altar so he could stand up saying mass. When he was done, another priest would take over, it was continue one after the other. And what that chaplain was doing out there, he had brought out the host and the, and the water and the wine uh, that they could say the mass. So at this stage, the uh, chaplain's driver says, well, the chaplain's got to stay here. I'll show you the rest of the camp. And at this stage, I look back, I, I hope, I, I was sorry I saw the rest of the camp in some way. He took us over to the building they called the crematorium. We walked in there and opened the door and there's three ovens where they disposed of the bodies. The fires were out, but the doors were open. You could still see the remains in there. Goodness and one of the horrible parts of this, over on the right, German efficiency had gone to pot they were killing him faster than they could dispose of the body, yeah. and they had a waiting room over here. It was, uh, oh, probably oh, bigger than this building, this, this uh, room right here. Hmm. And it was loaded with nothing but naked, decaying, stinking, rotting bodies, six, seven feet high. And I looked at that, good God. The other side of the room was a, a room that was nothing in it, and that was the shower room. The prisoners were told they were going to get a shower. They'd go and take the clothes off, then they'd turn the water on, <coughs> turn the gas on, gas them. They'd all die. And uh, they'd pump the gas out, and then they opened the doors. And a detail of other prisoners have to go in and pick up their dead comrades and, take them and put them into the ovens. Mm -hmm. And uh, the story was there, they didn't dare complain about that job because if they did, the next day they were in the oven. I said, get me out of here. And the driver said, come on, I'll show you the rest of this place. Took us outside the camp, and there was a famous death train of Dachau. What was transpiring? In the latter part of the war, they were trying to uh, eliminate or remove the other prisoners of war in the same way with the uh, political prisoners. And uh, Buchenwald's about to be liberated by the British, so they took as many prisoners out of Buchenwald, put them in about 20 boxcars, in three days, they drove them down to Munich. They had about at least 60 plus in there, just enough room to stand. They got down to Dachau, and they didn't have any place for them there. I want to tell you, no room at the inn. Mm -hmm. They left them in these boxcars for three weeks, then opened the door, and they all starved to death. Oh, my goodness. And they tell the story, and I, I found that, and you can go into your library and get pictures of the 42nd. They got some of these tapes of the guys that left to liberate it. <clears throat> they talk about the 42nd Division. It was the first one on, on the scene there. And the scouts are out. The first guy gets up to this train and he sees this and he couldn't talk. He ran back to his, to his sergeant and all he could do was point. Mm -hmm. And the whole squad went up there and there was this death train. They opened the doors and some of most of the doors were open. One of the doors they tell the story, there was a hand still moving. It says, still. my God, somebody's still alive. They went in there, pulled him out, got him to the hospital, nursed him back to health, and he survived. Wouldn't he be a great one for your stories? That's an amazing story. Oh. But anyway, when I got there, it was about three or four days after it had been liberated, and they were trying to clean this mess up. And they uh, uh, had a two and a half ton truck back up to one of the uh, the, the, uh, tr the cars there, and they had a couple of German prisoners in there taking the bodies, one on the arm, one on the left, and throwing them on this truck. And I stood there for a minute, and geez, I will never forget that sound of dead body hitting dead. At this stage, I'm about sick in the stomach, and it's all I could stand. I said, get me out of here. Man's inhumanity. Sure. And, there, and you were only 22 years old. 22, 20 years old. Oh my goodness sakes. Tom, it's just, it's incredible. Um, <clears throat> and as you pointed out, we have seen some of the death pictures and of those camps and so forth. And, uh, and particularly for me that uh, served in the South Pacific at sea, 
This is something almost incomprehensible, how horrible it was. As you say, man's human inhumanity to man. Yeah, the rest of the rest of the story, Ted, and I was telling Dennis earlier on, the, uh, the uh, uh, Holocaust is well documented. We got a museum up in Washington, yeah. and what they did to the Jewish people, and depending whose figures you want to read, five, six, seven million Jews died in those yeah. ovens. And but not, you, only, not and only That Jews, was only but they part killed. of it. You know the rest of the story? Here's a book that I got out of your library down here. Oh, yes. And I subsequently got a copy. It's called The Day of the Americans, written by a guy named Nuran Gun, and he was a Turkish newspaper correspondent in 1942-43. He was in Berlin sending stories back to Turkey, the neutral Turkey, and the Germans didn't like what he was sending back. So they arrested him and made him a prisoner. Hmm. And he went through about, oh, three or four or five camps. He ended up in Dachau, and he writes this book about the last day, about Dachau and the last days of it, and how when the troops came there, obviously it's a great day for him. Goodness but here's the guy, now this guy is an Arab, a Muslim, and here's what he writes I'd like to share with you to close this thing up. And he writes here, I would like to not to, would, would like to try to destroy the legend that the surviving Jews and their coordinates have created, which is solidly implanted the United States in which you have to us to believe that the Jews were the only victims of the concentration camp and only civilians persecuted by Hitler. It's further down, he says, nothing could be less than true or more unfair. The statistics show it. There were almost as many Catholics massacred by Hitler as the Jews. So there you have it. Yeah, uh, yeah. You don't hear about the other seven, well, eight uh, million Christians that died. That's right. All you hear about it. Eastern, Eastern uh, Europeans from the Baltic countries and all those uh, places that were uh, conquered by the Nazis. Yeah. Tom, this is an incredible story. You're, you're a remarkable, remarkable man. Uh, not only a, a survivor, but a great, a great American citizen. And you have stood for uh, your comrades and uh, honoring the ex-prisoners of war. Uh, tell me about that insignia on your cap. It looks like a cross, but it isn't a cross. What is that? Uh, you know what, Ted? I really don't know the significance of it. Okay. I'm a member of the XPOWs. Yeah. Uh, oh, the rest of the story. After that place, we got back to the apartment. Uh, three days later, they flew us up to camp. Lucky strike. Oh, uh, we got that. uniforms. They started feeding us, put us on a boat, got back to Cincinnati. On June 6, 1943, I was in Cincinnati, one year after D-Day. And that is my story. You mean 1945? That was another birthday present. Yeah. Lucky you. Well, look at you. You're a survivor and you're, you're just, uh, uh, the story, Tom, is just is marvelous. And the way you tell it, everyone who will see this DVD that you get of this interview will be so proud of you and so happy to see your story. Have you written your memoirs or anything like that? Uh, I've started to, and they keep telling me I should do this. I've I written know. several different stories. They tell us all that. Dennis uh, has got copies of our, the story how I was uh, you know, captured and so right, forth. Right, right, right. But I haven't written a complete story. In this well, way. that's that's very. This important. will take care of my <laughs> sure. my well, legacy I, I on the. I hope you're able to do that because uh, things like this should never die, and we've lost so many men, you know, who didn't tell their stories, and of course they'll, they'll be lost forever. Yeah. But Clo Closing thought on this, this, okay. is, this was my mother's war. Uh, yes. She received eight telegrams. By the end of the war, she was on first name basis with the Western Union man. I can imagine uh, That was so. before computers and uh, oh, yes. uh, email guys. Sure, the first one the door my, and all. The first one, my brother Jack was missing in action. The second one, he was killed in action. The third, that I was seriously wounded in action. The third, that I, fourth, that I was missing in action. That was the second MIA telegram she got. You can Good imagine goodness. what she was thinking by that oh time. Oh my goodness. Got a little better with number five reported I was a prisoner of war than the rest of them that I was liberated and I'm on the way home when I'm in the country. Oh. And my mother, God love her, she, she oh. had an awful war. Oh, she had a terrible war, yeah. And she had that gold star flag in the window, I'm sure. Yeah, like yeah, she had. Yeah, 
She had, now, did you come she, in? She had a flag, you know, they had the, the blue star, blue star, and yeah. gone. My mother had that. Oh, goodness. I don't know sakes. whatever happened to that. I wish I'd held on to that. I know. That is, those things are, were precious and, and so telling. <clears throat> because the families did suffer, the families who stayed behind, who had their children and more, you know. Yeah. It was a horrible thing. We got a little time left there. We're running out yeah, of Yeah, I got a couple of minutes. Okay, real quick story. When I was a prisoner of war, I kept a diary, and here it is. Oh, good for you. About 45, 50 years later, after reading Broke on, he's trying to convince us we we're the greatest generation, uh, I typed up it. Finally typed it up. And then I took it down. I went to CET last year when they were running their series down there, and I took my type copy, and they retyped it, retyped all my typos and spelling mistakes, and here's my diary. 200 days hit in the life of Thomas Lenoin, and I venture to say there's very few, if there aren't any other POW, can tell you exactly where they were on each two on each day they were a prisoner. That's marvelous. That's a collector's item. Well, you mm -hmm. are you're special because. I thank you people here. I think the library is doing a great job. Well, you're you're a special person to be thoughtful enough to number one, keep your memoirs and uh, and to keep your memory fresh. That is so important, and as we all know, uh, we have friends who have lost their memories and so forth. Okay. Uh, we've had the honor, the great privilege of talking to Thomas Linneman, Cincinnati, Hyde Park, St. Mary's School, Purcell High School. Now, did you go to college? Uh, After the war, I took advantage of the GI Bill, one absolutely. of the best programs they ever had. Absolutely. Spent four years at Xavier University. Wonderful. After that, I went into the rubber business and yep. retired as president of Netherlands Rubber Company in 1994. Successful businessman. Well, God bless you, and we thank you. Um, your, your other brother is still with you? No, he died so about 10 years ago. Oh, my goodness. He died of cancer from smoking. Oh, ho. So you're the, uh, you're the end of the to line? As, yeah, you're the end of the line as <laughs> yep, far as your yep, generation yep, is concerned. Yep. Yeah. Ted, well, thank, thank you. you so much. It's been an honor and a pleasure. And My pleasure. God bless. Right.